Thank you for your kind welcome. It's um, very good indeed to see uh, some of our alumni here from uh, years gone by. You're most welcome. And this uh, talk came out of uh, something actually organised by the Trinity students themselves uh, a few months ago for the Trinity Scientific Society. And the idea was to commemorate uh, Mosley, uh, Henry or Harry Mosley as, as he was known. As Sue has said, uh, was Trinity's greatest scientist, and I think uh, I can say that even though, of course, we've had three Nobel Prize winners. And it's generally accepted that had Mosley not uh, been killed tragically in the First World War in 1915, uh, he would have gone on to win the Nobel Prize for physics. And uh, Mos this is a very uh, uh, a good year to talk about Mosley. 1914 was when Mosley came up with his famous law and, of course, tragically killed in 1915. So 100 years ago, uh, Mosley's law, which put what we know as the periodic table, the order of the elements, in the correct order. Now, you'll notice that the title of my talk is Mosley's Law. And it could be that the development office have you here on false pretenses, thinking that I'm going to tell you, give you a, a talk that's essentially historical. But I'm tutor in physics here, and the students here know that you can't get away from any talk with me without learning some physics, whatever your background. So in fact, although we'll talk about a bit of the history, I'm going to try my best, maybe I'll fail, to try and get you ac across to you some of the actual physics. Now, I have borrowed a lot for, the, uh, for what I've put into the talk from, from two sources. The authority on Mosley is a chap called John Heilbrunn. There's a very good biography that he's written that has uh, full transcripts of Mosley's letter to his, to his family, to fellow scientists of the day, and we really learn from that what it was like for Mosley uh, throughout his career and throughout his Trinity days. And also uh, 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 another um, uh, scientist here, a chemist, Russ Egdall, who's professor, or just retired actually as professor of chemistry here in Trinity, has kindly lent me some of his slides as well, which he's been giving uh, to, to his uh, colleagues in chemistry. So I'm going to do four things in this talk. I'm going to give, I, I will say a little bit about history because it's good to give some context, give you a very brief biography of Mosley and his early life. Then I want to try and give you a flavour of the state of knowledge around the years 1912 to 1914. One of the most, and remember that Mosley graduated from Trinity in 1910. Most of his best work was done in the, just a period of 18 months, but there was four months where he put half the periodic table in order. It, absolutely amazing. I mean, he was, he was a, uh, an extremely hard worker, extremely bright, extremely intuitive. But then I'm going to try and say something about the experiments and Mosley's law and perhaps I hope to get across to you something of what he, he actually did and how he went about doing it. And maybe we'll end up with discussing a bit about Mosley's legacy, because one of the things that strikes me, if we go back and see what he did 100 years ago, is I just have to look around the college, and almost all of us in the physical and, to a certain extent, in the life sciences, are using techniques that are exactly the same as what Mosley and scientists of his day <coughs> pioneered perhaps with more sophisticated answers, but it started there. So brief biography, he was born in 1887 in Dorset. His parents were themselves scientists. Henry Nottage was his father. He died at the age of 47 when Harry was three. So he never knew his father, but he was, uh, mostly his father was a great naturalist. He was part of the uh, Challenger expedition, for example. He was well known to Charles Darwin, and Darwin is going to enter this story again. And his mother was also a uh, daughter of the naturalist John, was John Gwynne Jeffries. Uh, so Mosley would have had, if you like, the, the flavour of science around him from a very early age. He went to school, first of all, up in Summertown uh, at Summerfield School, and then on to Eton College, where he become, became a King's Scholar and uh, excelled in mathematics and in physics and in chemistry, 
Um, he, he won the geology and physics prizes at Eton, and he didn't enter for chemistry. There's a letter home where he says to his mother, I don't think I'll enter for the chemistry prize because I, you know, I think I'll give someone else a chance this year. <laughs> and, and he wasn't saying that in, I, I truly believe he, he wanted to give someone else a chance. We'll see later, uh, his attitude towards you know, getting the result and getting you know, for self-glory, that wasn't what it was about. Uh, we'll see that coming in later. And he came up uh, to Trinity in 1906. He was clearly already very gifted at mathematics. I was, I was looking through his letters to his mother, and as a 17-year-old, he said, oh, Ma, I've just found out that 16, 1156, triple 1, double 5, 6, quadruple 1, triple 5, 6, they're all squares. <laughs> and I did last time leave it as a... As a um, exercise for my students to sort of hand into my pigeonhole and if, you know, next, next time round what the answer to that is. But I never received it, I don't know why. But <laughs> it's actually not too difficult. But, that, you know, he was already thinking up these little problems when he was at 17. So, I mean, there is a... Another side to this story is that he did apply to uh, an institution that you may have heard of. Um, <laughs> Uh, but unfortunately, he applied for a scholarship there. Um, <laughs> it was already in the bag for Huxley, uh, we understand. And he rejected Balliol. So we have, first of all, very, very good decision made by Mosley, and was offered a scholarship here uh, at Trinity, uh, at one of the Millard scholars. He, um, we can go and find in the, as, as all of you as old members and have all written in the, in the register, uh, in, we have, of course, uh, in, the, in the archive, uh, Mosley's entry in the College Register. Here it is here, in, in October the 12th, 1906. He started off uh, reading for maths, mods, and then decided to do physics. He did originally thought about doing chemistry, but second good decision was to do physics rather well. Um, but Trinity then didn't have any physics tutors, and he was, uh, got occasional tutorials from Nagel, but most of, most of the time he was farmed out for St. John's. We don't actually have a lot of uh, information on um, the sort of tutorials he had. So here are his parents, as I said. And I, I think it's very poignant to see pictures of uh, Mosley as a young boy. On the right there, about exactly the time he would have come up to Trinity, 18, 18 years old. It's been each year, as you know, I mean, we're, we're just a week ago welcomed our new intake of freshers and it's, you know, you see all of these fresh faces over freshers dinner and the president gives the speech. It would have been exactly the same. It's, it's, you can see that, that looking forward to the future in Mosley's eyes. He was um, a very great rower here in college, or very keen rower, I don't know if he's necessarily a very good, good rower, and towards the end of his time, uh, we have pictures of Mosley in all four years while he was here. Here's the 1910 torpids. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but it's quite um, poignant when we go back and look at these college photographs to realise how many of the people in this photograph did not make it through the Great War. So here's some potted biography. Although he was a brilliant scientist and took finals in 1910, everyone expected Mosley to get a first, but he didn't. Um, it seems his uh, story of the time was that it was extremely hot during that uh, summer. The heat, as he said, was overpowering. He couldn't sleep. An owl was squeaking all night. And um, he, he thought he'd spoiled all his chances. But uh, also, um, I'm glad to see, as someone who uh, examines finals myself, he didn't blame the uh, <laughs> examiners, which is often what we get. Um, and so, good judgment shown all round by Mosley. He got a second, and as you know, in those days, it's only quite recently in Oxford's history that we've uh, had uh, two ones and two twos, he was awarded a second. But his reputation was such that um, he got extremely good references uh, to stay in the science field. And he moved up to Manchester immediately after finishing in Trinity to work with the famous scientist Rutherford. And he worked for Rutherford as a, as a teaching assistant and doing some, some research. Um, and what we're going to go through in the rest of the talk is some of the physics that happened, because around 1912, um, 
Some work was being done in Germany, and I'll show you what was being done, where they suddenly, uh, the, the, the German scientist von Laue discovered that he sh if he shone x-rays onto a crystal, um, you, see, you see some spots. That may sound not very interesting, but that was extremely exciting at the time. And Mosley worked together with Darwin's grandson to work out what these spots meant. And they worked out a law that showed you where the spots appeared. And I'll show you what these spots are as we go through the, through the lecture. And in fact, he went up uh, to Leeds to give a talk about this in 1912. Gave the presentation and said, look, I know what Lowy's, von Lowy's spots are. The Germans don't understand it at all. I've got the answer. And learned from Bragg, who was the professor of physics at Leeds, that Bragg's son, who was an undergraduate at Cambridge, had sort of worked out the same thing as an undergraduate and just sent his father a letter a few days earlier. Mosley's I, I know what the reaction would be in the physics department today. Then, you know, the claws would be out about whose results this was. Mosley's reaction, oh, you take that result. Your son must have, you know, I've, I, I worked it out a few, but I've only just come public with it. You've told me your son's done it. The Braggs went on to win the Nobel Prize for that. That was Mosley's attitude. Oh, you take that. So, but after spending some time in 19, up to about 1912 and 13, he starts to think of returning to Oxford. Um, but there isn't, a, you know, he wants to get a position at Oxford, but the fails in his first attempt and then decides, well, I'll just come back anyway. So he came back on no, without a job essentially. He got a small grant from a, somewhere, but not a salary, and set up himself um, in the Trinity, well, this is where we had worked together, the Trinity Balliol Labs. And that's where the famous picture is taken. So this is him uh, uh, in the Trinity Balliol Labs, which are now just behind, <coughs> but have been knocked down now, close to the squash court. But I really do think that as a college, we ought to have some plaque there commemorating Mosley. We have one commemorating Krebs, who won the Nobel Prize, but not one for Mosley. But there's a picture of Mosley in the Trinity Balliol Labs. So then, just to, to, to complete the, his, the, the potted history, he worked out all of the periodic table, and I'm going to show you quite how he did that, up to about the summer of 1914, all of the elements up to gold. Up to, he worked out 79 elements and put them all in their right order, uh, and understood quite a bit of the physics of what was going on. He set sail, there was a, at the time in 1914, in, summer, there were, in the summer of that year, there was a, a meeting, uh, which many of the most famous international scientists went to, of a British meeting of the advancement of science, but it was in Australia. He set sail in 1914 via Canada to go to that meeting. But during that time, war broke out. And he came back, he turned down a desk <coughs> job in the army, he tried uh, we, we see evidence that he tried his best and succeeded in making sure that he went to the front. As many of the you know, officers that came from the public school at the time, they knew where their place was, and we know that they had twice the death rate than the, the common soldier at the time. And he gets a signals officer position in the front with the Royal Engineers, and then he fought in the Battle of Gallipoli, uh, just uh, uh, obviously modern-day Turkey, uh, just just south of the border there with Greece, and was shot by a sniper in August 1915. And um, we know, you know, he doesn't have a grave. There is a memorial there that I'll show you, so you, show you a picture of. I mean, there are several hundred bones of several hundred soldiers there. And nobody knows who, who, uh, who they are. So what was the state of knowledge when Mosley did his work? Let's remember that he's just graduated two years after he's uh, come out of Trinity, um, the concept at that time was, when we looked at the smallest scale, it was realised that atoms exist, existed, but it was very there was a very confused idea about what an atom actually was. And also, nobody really knew what made an element. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron. And they sort of knew how to, that they, they got heavier. That's about as much as they knew, that if you took an atom of a particular element, as you went up, they got heavier. 
and they decided effectively to put them in the order of the weight. And that's about as far as they got. And that was known as Mendeleev's ordering, the famous Russian scientist, and we'll find out that mostly shows it's wrong in several places. About eight to ten years previously, J.J. Thompson had suggested something known as the plum pudding model of the atom. Uh, he th they knew that there were things that, uh, they knew a lot about electricity, they knew that there were things that they would call positive charges and things they'd call negative. For those of you, it's, it's a long time since you've done your physics, it's a, a little bit like saying something's a north pole and a south pole. You know, if, if they're the same, they repel. If they're opposite, they attract. They knew there was something like that. But they didn't know what that really had to do with atoms. Thompson thought that maybe you just had this, this, this sea, this, this sea of, uh, of positive stuff with some negative raisins dropped into it. Um, and that was, of course, wrong. There had been some experiments done in 1911 by Rutherford. Remember, Rutherford was the scientist that Mosley went to work with uh, uh, up in Manchester, where work done by Rutherford had shown that that model couldn't be right. And he'd done this by shining some positive particles just through a thin foil of gold and found that every now and again, one of them got knocked straight back. And uh, Rutherford worked out that that must mean that positive charges form very small nuggets. That, you know, very small nuggets and the negative charge is around them. Um, but he wasn't taken seriously. This was not taken seriously at all. So, and we know that because uh, it, even as, as late as 1922 uh, uh, in the... Uh, Niels Bohr, who won the, well, Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize in 22, but in 1962, when he was uh, going through his, his memoirs, he talks about the fact that Rutherford's work wasn't really taken seriously. It wasn't until, until Mosley came along a couple of years later that people started to realise what was going on. So as I say, in 1912, they had some idea, you don't need to read this, but it's got different elements in it. It's got hydrogen here, lithium, beryllium, you may, calcium, potassium. I'm sure you know all of these uh, symbols off by heart. Um, but it's actually, when you look at it, that's the table they would have had in 1912 uh, by the Russian scientist Mendeleev. It was based on how heavy something was. And this turns out to be wrong. Uh, we know now it's wrong, mostly didn't know it at the time, we know now it's wrong because we know that the centre of <coughs> atoms have things that are positive, little particles that are positive, which we call protons, that weigh something. <coughs> but we also know that they have some neutral ones. Roughly the same number, but not always the same number. So it's, it's, it's not evident that everything goes up in the order you would expect, because sometimes you'll have too many neutral, well, more neutral particles than you might have expected, sometimes a bit less, and they weigh something. And that's what makes the order wrong in terms of what Mendeleev was doing. So what did Mosley actually do? It was that it all starts in the summer of 1912, or well, the work is done in the summer of 1912, Mosley's on holiday, he comes back and reads Von Laue's, about von Laue's work. It got across uh, from Germany about what v von Laue had done. And what Laue had done, in fact, we find out it's Laue's minions, is he'd taken some x-rays, just like uh, you would get x-rays in uh, going to the dentist or whatever, and shone them through, uh, made a little beam of them by making a hole in some lead, and shone them onto a crystal and seen lots of spots. That was all he saw. And to this day, these spots are called Lowy spots. Now, the Germans got it completely wrong. I'll go forward to this. Uh, in 1912, after a few months' work, Mosley says the, writes to his mother, and this is when he's telling Bragg what the answer is. Um, he, he works out what the real meaning of the experiments were. And this, this is what he says about von Lowy. The men who did the work entirely failed to understand what it meant and gave an explanation that was obviously wrong. What Lowy was trying to say was that somehow the x-rays coming from here sneaked through gaps in the, in, in the material, and they could only get through certain gaps. What Mosley worked out was, in fact, 
with, with, his, with the grandson of Darwin, they worked out something that to this day is known as Bragg's Law and is what won the Braggs a couple of years later a Nobel Prize. And the law is uh, the following, and this is where some real physics comes in, is Mosley at the time knew that light, including x-rays, was some sort of wave. It went up and down and up and down. It's actually a wave of an electric and a magnetic field. And a crystal, they also uh, had the concept at the time that a crystal was an array of atoms very regularly arranged, like soldiers on parade. You know, red one, green one, red one, green one. Very, very regular. That's why when you see a crystal, you, you know, the faces of a crystal are nice and flat and cut. It's because you're, you're cleaving down <coughs> individual planes of these atoms. They had some concept of that. And mostly worked out that with Bragg, that this meant that when X-rays hit a crystal, they would only come off and reflect at certain angles, known as the Bragg angle. Because what you had to do is, the waves coming up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, it bounces off the first set of atoms. The next wave comes up and down, up and it bounces off the second set of atoms. And if it comes off at a certain angle, when this wave is going up, you'll see so is this wave going up. When this wave is going down, this wave is going down. And so they, it's a bit like that reinforcement. Have you ever tried, I'm sure you don't do this anymore, as, but when I was a kid in the bath, you would slosh backwards and forwards and you get just the right frequency and then you make a whole <laughs> almighty mess. And it's, if everything's going up and down at the same time, it all reinforces. And Mosley therefore worked out that this angle that things reflected at you know, only happened at certain angles, and it was related, the angle was related to the distance between going up and down and up and down, what we call the wavelength, and was also related to the spacing in the atoms. Now, I don't have an X-ray tube here, and I don't have um, a crystal, but an analogous thing can be done with my laser pointer. In the same way as I have here a set of atoms regularly arranged like soldiers on parade, this is essentially the same as a CD. You know, if you take a, one of your CDs, it's really lots of lines going, well, like circles, but they're all evenly spaced. Like an old LP, the grooves are evenly spaced. And you'll notice that if I shine my laser pointer through here, I get lots of spots. Every single one of those spots is doing exactly what Mosley said. Factor of two difference, which my students will explain to you. But you can see, look, they're coming off. Now you'll notice as well that what this, what this would mean is because everything has to come up, off going up and down and up and down, if I change the wavelength, if I made the light shorter from peak to peak, the angle would change. Okay. Well, let's try. We have a green laser pointer. We have a red laser pointer. Do you see that the red is more widely spaced than the, than the green? Okay. <coughs> this gets a little more diff difficult. I can't hold them all down. I'll try my best. Put this down for a moment. Right. Oh, not right. Yes. Now, there we go. There's the red coming in. You see the red is spaced most widely. Let's do it. Let's do it one by one. There's red. There's green, closer together. There's blue. So I thought I'd bring a trinity of colours thing with <laughs> Now, that is is, is Bragg's law for this. There is a factor of two, but it's essentially what's going on. And you'll notice that that means you can do one of two things. That was Bragg's law. Bragg's law was relating this scattering angle, the fact that they're coming off, because you might say, well, why am I getting lots of spots? I thought I'd teach you some physics. Well, you can see that there's, there's a slip in, one, in, in, in wavelengths as you go here. If I go up to another angle, I can slip two wavelengths. Or I go up to another angle, I can slip three. As long as I slip an integer number, they're also going to still be adding, going up and going down at the same time. That was Bragg's law. That's what won 
bragged the Nobel Prize, who worked it out mostly. But you can also see, and this, this is where the story between the Braggs and Mosley then divides, as you've seen the spacing of the colours. The spacing depends on the colours. So I can go and do one of two things. I can either use this new physics to find out, the spacing <coughs> also depends on this, you know, how far apart the atoms are in the crystal. The Braggs then made a career of using this technique to look at the crystals. Mosley spent his 18 months with one crystal looking at the colours. Because he said to himself, all the colours of the X-rays, that's to say their wavelength, must be telling me something about where they're coming from. So um, Mosley seeds the no didn't know he was seeding a, a, Mos a Nobel Prize, but effectively was. And as I say here, the Braggs decided to use those X-rays to study crystals. Mosley says, oh no, I'm going to take one crystal and look at the wavelength of X-rays that are produced when I, ex you know, when I look at different elements. Because these X-rays are produced by shining electrons onto different elements. And what Mosley found out was that if he shone these electrons onto different elements, they would all produce different colours. Like I just showed you, one there is red, one was blue, one was green. He found they had different colours. And he was looking at those colours, those wavelengths, to, to, to say, what does that tell me about the element? This is his apparatus. Um, there is a... Uh, I told you that there was a, a crystal involved. Well, first of all, he has to create his, create his X-rays. So what he does is he puts the elements he's interested in down here. And... Um, this is a little tube that accelerates electrons onto them to make them emit X-rays, to make them emit the different colours. Those different colours come off. This is his crystal of ferrocyanide. And then he put a, a little photographic plate in here. And just by moving this plate around, he could measure in the same way as I, I can measure the angle that these uh, different spots are coming off, he can measure the angle at which the X-rays came off. And that's all he did. But he, he already showed himself to be... Um, a very resourceful young scientist. One of the hardest things at the time, uh, well, one of the most important people in any lab at the beginning of the 20th century was the glass blower, because everything had, all this is done under vacuum. So Mosley uh, managed to get someone to make him this X-ray tube, but then had the brilliant idea of rather than having a, a tube with one element, so let's, you know, wouldn't put some calcium in there to see what, how that's excited, and then you put some a scandium in or something, decided to make a little trolley of all of the elements under vacuum with a little piece of silk and the little trolley would move along one, one at a time so he could put about a dozen elements into a single tube. And there's a little bobbin in the top right hand corner there that he would turn and so he could do essentially a, a dozen experiments uh, at, at a time. But uh, I'll show you later that this setup of having some x-rays here a crystal here and a detector here is essentially an experiment that I still do, and many of us still do. It just so happens that now, rather than using this film, I would use a, a, bit, a bit like a, a camera, you know, like an iPhone camera that works for X-rays, you know, a, CC, a little CCD. Um, instead of having a uh, X-ray tube, I use a, a th three-mile-long linear accelerator in Stanford, but essentially it's the same experiment, um, and it's true. So, and this is a schematic, so you have this little target on a trolley, high energy electrons, and these high energy electrons would just come in the same way as, you know, uh, 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 older members will remember proper televisions with tubes, rather than these plasma LED devices. And you remember that little spot that when you turned it off and after the Queen's speech, that, that's a little, or of course it's electrons that were, then were exciting the back of the, you know, the phosphor on the screen. It's the same idea, he would accelerate electrons, but rather than hitting a TV screen, is just hitting his target, and all they knew at the time, all they knew is that you got these X-rays, and then that, so these, but they came out with different colours. They bounce off the crystal, and he'd measure the angles. And what he found, in the same way as I just showed to you, that I can take two different colours and get different spacings, as you can see, he found that where the colours came on his film, this is changing the angle, changed with the element. 
and they changed as long as he put the elements in a particular order you can see they're changing in a very regular way here's copper nickel cobalt iron and he's just lined these are all just little photographs lined up with the angle at which he meant made measured them notice already something in here that you may not notice he's put he this is a nickel target clearly he can't swap these around and get the right order in Mendeleev's table nickel and cobalt are the other way around because their weights would make you think they're the other way around so Mosley already was onto something that they must come in this different order from in Mendeleev's table this is from his uh, philosophical magazine uh, in 1914 and then he of course wanted to know in the same way as I've told you if we go back to Bragg's law that we can know the color when we say we know the color it means we know this distance from peak to peak or another way of thinking about it is we know the frequency we know how fast the wave is going up and down as it passes you so Mosley obviously then went back and said well okay this this is a, a pretty picture but is there a formula that fits this is there some simple simple piece of mathematics well, but once I've worked out what this color is, once I've worked out what this wavelength is, is there a simple piece of mathematics that fits? And there was. He found out that if he called, for example, um, iron number 26, 25, uh, uh, and called um, <laughs> titanium number 22, is it 21? Yeah, uh, I have to work it out now. He could he could find a formula that was essentially three quarters of say for iron 26 squared but he had to subtract one he didn't know why he had to subtract one but he found a formula first of all the funny thing is it has a three quarters in front of it then when he put things in order so he actually started with aluminium which is 13 so he started aluminium 13 silicon 14 and so forth um, and he put those numbers in there everything fitted when I say everything fitted, it was like a part in 200 sometimes out. It was very, very accurate. But he didn't know where the three quarters came from. He had a formula, but he didn't know what it meant. And one of the wonderful things that he did, though, was he was very, very accurate. To get that answer to a part in a 200, he had some very, very good insights. Now, one of the things, for example, is that if you're measuring angle, <laughs> All of this is under vacuum, we've pumped out all of the air. He needs to know the precise, you'd think he needs to know the precise <coughs> angle that the X-rays bounce off this crystal. So he must make, but it's very difficult to do an experiment without jogging things and well, without having some sort of error. So what did Mosley do? He said, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the following. Instead of what we notice when, when we uh, look through here, is I see a series of spots, one, two, I see many of them. Uh, but of course, if, if, I, if I move the angle, you know, if I, if I jog my apparatus, they shift. So Mosley said, well, I don't need to worry about the shift. All I need to do is measure from, um, all I need to do is, is, to, is, to, is to measure the, What I can do is I can take and measure this spot and the distance to this one, and as long as I keep measuring the distance between them, it doesn't matter if I have a shift. The distance between them will always be the same. Um, and so that's why he said, oh, I won't just measure one spot, I'll measure the, the next one and the next one, and then I can eliminate my <coughs> error. And he, he did that. Um, he eliminates his error uh, in that way. And um, what uh, I find interesting about that is that we only have, when I say we, it's in the, muse the Museum of the History of Science, just opposite Trinity, we only have two pages of Mosley's notes remaining. And this is one of them. And a couple of years ago, a, uh, a young woman was, uh, came over from the States to do a master's degree in the history of science. And for her thesis, she took a look at these pages of notes couldn't and couldn't understand them. She knew the, you know, let's ask a Mosley's at Trinity, let's ask a physicist at Trinity. Happened to be me, or well, is me. And what was fascinating is going through these notes and knowing that that must have been what Mosley did, you can see there's lots of scribbling out on these notes. 
you know, he's, he's working out here, he's working out how far off his original angle was. But it, because I knew he was doing that, and where all of these things are scribbled out, what was fascinating on a, on a flight back from the States, is I managed to work out what all the numbers were underneath the scribbles. And you might say, well, why did our, our American friend not manage to do it? And the answer is she was too young. She hadn't done log tables throughout the whole of her, <laughs> whole of her career. And I said, you do realize he was using logs. And the, the mathematicians and, and scientists here will understand this. And she said, oh, I know, I know. And I looked at the piece of paper, but I could never get his numbers. And I said to her, did you try subtracting one? Said, oh. <laughs> and then it worked. But that was a, a lovely few evenings there spent deciphering what these numbers are underneath, uh, underneath the scribbles. And working out, in fact, that he, uh, exactly what his error was in the original shift. Very, very, and down to this accuracy of a part in 200, and that formed part of her thesis, uh, successfully defended in 2012. Mostly, so he worked out this formula, 3 quarters z minus 1 squared, where z is the element, as I say, 13 for magnesium, 14 for silicon, and so forth. Once he, but he went all the way up to, uh, quite high, up to about uh, 42 or so, and then he, he found that uh, the line started all over again. He, he, he couldn't go much further. The line started in, in another way. And he found another formula for the uh, heavier elements. Here's a 3 quarters. Here's a 5 36. Here he had to subtract 1. Here he has to subtract nearly 8. What's going on? He didn't at the time know. Um, now we do. Now we do because, uh, and mostly I think himself would have just about worked it out <coughs> had events not turned out in a tragic way. Um, what we know now, oh, this doesn't, doesn't fit, uh, let's go back. What we know now is that within, uh, that atoms are made up of this central nucleus, this heavy part that's positively <coughs> charged, and that the electrons go round it uh, in orbits. The electrons are very, very light, Typically, an you know, the constituents that make up this nucleus, the positive and neutral charges, are about two, th each one of them is nearly 2,000 two times heavier than each of these electrons. So in every atom of your, your body, all of the weight that you have is concentrated in this tiny nugget of a nucleus. When I say it's tiny, this nucleus here is about a hundred thousandth of the width of the atom. Most of you is empty space, not just between, no. <laughs> and so, you know, most of, you know, physicists don't think that matter is this hard, solid, billiard ball stuff. It gets a lot more complicated than this. But what was known at the time, or what Bohr came up with, and why you, you saw he got the Nobel Prize in 22, was that these, uh, these orbits had different energies associated with them. This orbit number one, this is orbit number two, orbit number three, and we're not going to get time to teach you all of this physics, but Bohr worked out that this orbit number one has an energy, it's actually an attractive binding energy, of one over one squared. Guess what this one was? One over two squared. Guess what this one would have been in hydrogen? One over three squared. Now, we say to ourselves, and Mosley didn't didn't know this, where does his three quarters come from? Where does his five thirty-sixths come from? Well, if I take one over one squared, I think most of us know that's one. One over two squared is, of course, a quarter. And I subtract them, what do I get? Three quarters. If I take one over, uh, if I now, though, uh, as we'll go forward, we could uh, do the same, oops, what's happened there? That wasn't going to happen. Uh, you can do the same thing between the uh, other elements. So now let's take uh, 1 over 3 squared minus 1 over 2 squared, and so forth. And this is where you're going to find the 536 comes from. And so Mosley didn't know this at the time. Now why subtract the 1? And again, Mosley wouldn't have known, probably would have worked it out. And really, um, a good uh, explanation for, or the best explanation we have for this <coughs> is now with quantum mechanics we know that these little electrons matter's not what you think it is they're smeared out in some way 
even it's not just you know the particle is smeared out in some way so that this electron here isn't filling the full z atomic number it's shielded a bit by the neighbor in its own orbit so that's where the z minus one comes from we know in this next orbit there we now know there are eight electrons so that's why you're subtracting nearly eight you might say well why is it nearly eight and not exactly eight and this again it's because there's this smearing out it doesn't work exactly uh, Mosley would not have known that. And what's going on in his experiment that I, is that he shines this electron into his atom. It hits an electron in the atom. That electron uh, in that shell then pops out, as does the original one. And there's a hole left. Mosley wouldn't have known this, but there's a hole left there in each of his elements. That hole, by the way, lasts, it depends on the element, but it typically lasts about for a mid z a mid element uh, about a femtosecond so if you don't know what that is we'll take a second and divide that by a thousand you get a millisecond divide that by a thousand you get a microsecond divide divide that by a thousand you get a nanosecond divide that by a thousand you get a picosecond that by a thousand you get a femtosecond so short basically <laughs> so it lives so so this is i'm, I'm slowing the movie down <laughs> So, so there's a hole there, and what we find is one of the uh, electrons in the outer orbit then drops back down. It has to release its energy somehow, and that's what's coming out as the X-ray. Mosley would not have known any of this, but he was, when he was measuring the X-ray, he then was saying something about how attractive this positive nugget, this nucleus in the center of the atom was. <laughs> And therefore, he was telling you how much positive charge there was there. And it's how much positive charge there is here that defines an element. Not how heavy it is. Not if we add you know, more of this neutral stuff. That's why he got things in the right order. So uh, that's what gave rise to Mosley's ladder. And as I told you, and you saw in the photograph, he immediately knew that some things were out of, out of order. Nickel, nickel and cobalt were wrong in the Mendeleev table, and he got them right. The other thing he found, he went all the way up to elements, took about 75 of them, is there were four that were missing. Try as he might, he could not find these four elements. You know, it was like someone playing a piano scale and missing out the notes. So interestingly, Mosley discovered four elements without even having them in the lab, without anybody having discovered them. He said there are four elements out there that have not yet been discovered. And he could even tell you which ones they were, number 43, 61, 72, and 75. We know them as technetium, promethium, hafnium, and rhenium. There are different reasons why they weren't uh, uh, discovered. 72 and 75 are essentially just rare. You'll have heard of things called rare earths. Um, they were discovered uh, some eight years after Mosley's law, just before Bohr, by the, well, by the way, gave his Nobel Prize address. And Bohr announced it uh, at the Nobel meeting. Uh, 43, pretty good reason why 43 wasn't there. It doesn't occur naturally in nature. That combination of positive and charges and neutral charges are such that as soon as you make 43, it says, I don't want to exist, I'm going to break down and become something else. So we can make it in the lab. It was first made artificially, but it doesn't last very long. First man-made element in 1937. And then there was left with number 61, promethium. And again, that is something that uh, is, uh, doesn't like hanging around very long, and it's first found in... Um, 1945, about 20 years after, in a, a nuclear fission pile. So there were good reasons why you couldn't find them. But at, you know, sometimes the absence of data is really important. And in this case, it was. Um, this sorting out, by the way, of the elements around number 70 was a big deal at the time. Uh, everyone was confused as to what they actually were. Everyone wanted to win a prize for it. Uh, and just before the end of Mosley's work, this is, in, in, I think, in the Easter of 1914, he received um, a letter from uh, Urbain, a chemist from, uh, uh, from Paris. And uh, this is actually in, in, in the June of that year. He had visited Mosley 
Mosley apparently didn't speak any French. Georges Aubin didn't speak any English. But they managed to sort out, you know, he'd come along with some samples. He, he was sure as a chemist he had this new element. And Mosley said, oh no, it's just a mixture of the old ones, and could prove to him that it was just a mixture of the old ones. And uh, Aubin was not particularly happy about Mosley being able to do that, but he was stunned that within essentially two days working with Mosley in the lab, he had the answer and definitively knew that he didn't have uh, any new element. And so he wrote later to Mosley, and he is one, I, as far as I can tell, who coined the, law, the, the phrase of Mosley's law. And he says here, J'ai beaucoup pensé à mon voyage à Oxford, à vos belles expériences, et surtout à ce qui portera dans la science le nom de la loi de Mosley. So I really enjoyed uh, my you know, trip to Oxford, and your absolutely beautiful experiments, remember, force of me here, and overall, that which will, will carry in, the name, in, in science the name of the law of Moses. Cette loi dont base à la classification de Mendeleev qui n'est pas point de vue scientifique qu'un joli roman. Vive la loi de Moses. So basically, <laughs> this law gives a basis to the classification of Mendeleev, which we remember was wrong, and from the point which, from a scientific point of view, was just a, a pretty story. Long live the law of Moses. So, what about his legacy? And I said, here in Trinity, we use essentially Mosley's techniques. I've taken some of the uh, view graphs here from Russ Egdor. As I say, he retired uh, this September as our, uh, one of our fellows in chemistry. He does exactly this to look at things like working out how batteries work. He ejects the electrons from the atoms with the x-rays and looks at the electrons. And this enables him to do research uh, that works out exactly how lead is operating, for example, in lead acetate batteries. The, you, know, you can either throw in the, uh, the electrons and watch the x-rays come out, or sometimes you can throw in the x-rays and watch the electrons come out, and you can tell what's going on, you know, how the atoms are, are interacting with each other. And that's what Russ does. And I don't want to explain necessarily what this is, uh, but just give you some ideas. Our uh, prof professor... Uh, Fran Ashcroft, a fellow of the Royal Society, you may have seen uh, of her work in um, the College magazine doing a lot of work on, on various types of diabetes, which she's managed to give uh, a lot of work in curing a very rare version of that. But she does work where she is finding out about the structure of proteins. You may not realize this, but much of drug design, much of the things that in modern medicine that we rely on, you need to know what are those drugs, how they're interacting with molecules in your body. Now remember I said that Mosley took one branch to look at the, um, look at the x-rays and the Bragg's, but he worked out Bragg's law, went to look at how the spots, what it told them about the crystals. Almost every single protein now so where we know, we know for about, I haven't looked recently, it's something like 75,000 proteins, we know where every single atom is in the protein. How do we do that? Essentially by shining x-rays onto the crystal and seeing these Lowy spots, using Bragg's, which I would call Mosley's law. Fran Ashcroft uses that, and many people in the life sciences, they make protein crystals, they can tell you where the atom is in each atom in those proteins. And that is what drives a lot of the idea about how you're going to design something to bind to a particular protein site. It's the same stuff. My own work, um, I do with a, a, a new JRF in Oxford, a chap called Sam Vinco, a JRF in Trinity. And so we, what we try and do is make matter that is similar to the conditions halfway to the center of the sun. Matter at about two million degrees, same density as halfway to the center of the sun, which actually is just normal density, it's not very dense. But you think you might be able, not be able to penetrate the sun, but for a brief fraction of a second we can make that. And we do that by using the linear accelerator in Stanford, and this linear accelerator creates like Mosley had an X-ray tube. This is the same, but just billions of times brighter. And it's so bright that uh, by, by by focusing those x-rays down onto matter, onto a, uh, onto a thin foil, I can make the same conditions as about uh, half the radius of the sun. 
where before, of course, we can't go there. So if we want to test what the structure of material is here and how atoms work in those environments, we have to make it in the laboratory. It doesn't hang around very long, I can tell you that. And because as soon as I've made it, the pressure is maybe about 10 times the pressure at the center of the Earth. So you know, it's, it's going to blow up pretty quickly. And again, these are experiments we do within these femtoseconds I was talking about. But what's fascinating about it is essentially, I told you that Mosley had an X-ray tube. Uh, so he, he had some X-rays, he bounced them off a crystal, and then he uh, recorded them on a detector. We, we take this linear accelerator and we shine it down to create this matter that looks like it's halfway to the center of the sun. It gets very hot, it emits X-rays. What do I do with those X-rays? I bounce them off a crystal. I put them on a detector. It's the same, it's just my detector is an electronic camera and Mosley's was a, a piece of Ilford film. And what's fascinating, I'm not going to go into the physics of this, is that in our latest research, I didn't realize this is from a paper in, in Nature that we published um, uh, just two years ago. And these X-rays that I was looking at are coming from exactly the same transitions in the atoms as Mosley's X-rays. The only difference is that as Mosley's going up his ladder, he's going from one element to the next. I'm taking the same element and just because it's getting hotter and hotter, I'm just stripping electrons away from the same element, but I'm looking at the same physics. And just as he sees a ladder, I see a ladder. And I, I, I just found that um, almost chilling to, to, to put those things side by side. But when I think when we talk about Mosley's legacy, um, we can't really just focus on the science. I think uh, we have to remember what he gave um, to his country, what he was doing. Um, as I said, he, uh, he did not need to go to the front. It's fairly evident that he could have had a desk job, and he didn't. And uh, as I say, just before his 28th birthday in August uh, 1915, he was shot in Gallipoli, and in, in, in many ways, the sacrifice that he gave is, is probably, I would say, the, the greatest legacy. Here's a picture, if, we, if you want to, uh, after uh, we finish in, a, in a, a couple of moments, this is just a picture here on the right. Many of you know of the memorial that we have in the college library. And if you look in the center row of names, just a few names down, you'll see the name of, of Mosley. Um, he changed how people looked upon scientists uh, and their way that they could interact in the, in the war effort. Um, let's go to this quote down here from Isaac Asimov. The most costly single death of the war to mankind. Whether that's correct or not, you know, it's impossible to say, but let's, I mean, that was the sort of tribute that people like uh, Asimov gave. The evening standard headline when they heard the news was sacrifice of a genius. And um, that led, I think, to uh, some, some quite profound changes, for example, in the Second World War. If you were a, a well-known scientist in the Second World War, you were not allowed to go to the front. You know, we, this is why you had your Bletchley Parks and you had your uh, things. That the government realized that you don't send um, your geniuses to the front. And uh, as I say, uh, if you go now to Gallipoli, you can see uh, the farm that he was defending at the time, just a, a few miles away from the coast and uh, the memorial there, the Hellas Memorial, uh, just inland from, from, from the Greek border. Um, and this is recognizing about 19,000 soldiers at the time. And one of the names that you'll find there is of Mosley. So, but perhaps for me, the most poignant thing is just seeing the fresh face of Mosley. He is just before he graduates, looking no different from, really, from the students of today in the quad looking no different. And there we are. That's the tribute to Mosley and Mosley's Law. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.